Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. And in this podcast, I want to talk uh, about the uses of the concentration camp system in Nazi Germany for uh, creating an entire generation of SS uh, prison guards and uh, later uh, genocidaires. Previously in this podcast, when we've looked at the development of the camp system, I've done uh, quite a few podcasts on this, mainly from the the brilliant book KL by Nicholas Rochman, which I'm going to look at now. Um, We've uh, explored this idea that the way the Nazis saw the camps were almost as kind of reform schools for the soul that um, communists and troublemakers and idlers and all these sorts of social riffraff would be put in at one end and then strict discipline and uh, other means would transform them into uh, worthwhile human beings. Um, Himmler said in a a radio broadcast, uh, the slogan that stands above these camps is there is a path to freedom. Its milestones are obedience, diligence, honesty, orderliness, cleanliness, sobriety, truthfulness, readiness to make sacrifices, and love of the fatherland. Of course, none of that was true. Um, The idea that Himmler had in his head uh, was a fantasy. It is perhaps one that he genuinely believed was possible, but he knew also that immense brutality and violence were the means by which the inmates were subjugated, and instead of them uh, becoming uh, almost robotic-like adherents to the fatherland, they simply survived the camps, uh, those did survive, as uh, broken men and women. Well, the uh, educational or transformative role that the camp had uh, had uh, a, a kind of a flip side to it in Himmler's eyes. And the camps would also be schools for uh, jailers as well as for inmates. Initially, the camps were run by the SA uh, in the first chaotic or so year of the camps. And there was the great dread of inmates being moved to new camps is that they would be moved to new camps where there would be an SA man who knew them. Uh, There were some high-profile political prisoners, uh, Ernst Talman, for example, of of the KPD, um, who were absolute magnets for SA violence. And uh, they were referred to laughingly as celebrities. But as the camp system evolved and the uh, camp uh, mechanisms became more and more under the control of the SS itself, the the camps become training schools. And Dachau particularly, the alumni of Dachau, go on to run Auschwitz and the other death camps during the war. Um, and the uh, system of the, the systems of administering, administering and bureaucratically running camps are, are learned there, but also every trick in the book about uh, intimidation, control of inmates, and the uh, use of uh, violence, of torture, and uh, repression, and psychological uh, games to be played against the inmates. These were all practiced at the camps as well. Now, you might think that there's perhaps not a great deal to learn here, that uh, being uh, able to be brutal to uh, people who are completely unable to defend themselves isn't necessarily an art form, and there's not much to uh, particularly uh, pick up once you've grasped the basics. And probably that's true, because the education that the uh, SS men were undergoing at the same time was a political and an ideological education. So here's what Nicholas Foschman has to say on the subject. He says, An elite unit of political soldiers, this is how Himmler and Eich like to depict the camp SS. In peacetime, Eich kept telling his men they were the only soldiers protecting the German fatherland, fighting day and night against the enemy behind the barbed wire of the concentration camps. The figure of the political soldier had been first popularised by the SA in the Weimar years, but it was quickly appropriated by Heinrich Himmler 
and his SS leaders, who led to style themselves as hard soldiers. Theodor Eich laid full claim to the term, which became so closely associated with him that after his plane was shot down on the Eastern Front in February, on February 26, 1943, his obituary in the Volkaischer Bierbachter carried the subheading, Eich, the political soldier. So there's a number of very interesting and illuminating things within that little passage alone. Uh, what Washman is, is arguing here is that uh, the SS saw uh, what was happening inside the gates of each camp as a, a battle, um, that uh, an ideological war was being waged to save Germany from the camp inmates. Instead of seeing the camp inmates as the most powerless and vulnerable individuals who had no agency at all once they, they were in custody, the uh, SS viewed them as an ongoing threat that what had to be um, defeated within them were the ideas that they came into the camp with lest they return back into society and re-poison this now um, perfected society or society uh, on the process towards um, ideological perfection with old ideas of socialism and liberalism and all this kind of stuff that the Nazis wanted to stamp out. So there was an intense and kind of almost invisible battle being fought uh, in each and every camp. And on the front line of that struggle was the Camp SS. Now, much of this, uh, these notions of struggle uh, and endless vigilance, these are some of the, the kind of the main kind of concepts, sort of um, uh, notions that underpin Nazism, uh, that uh, the uh, society really, a uh, Nazi society, is really one that is endlessly at war, either internally or externally. And if this dynamism, or this pace of this dynamism ever slows down, really you haven't got Nazism anymore, just a kind of hyper-nationalist uh, authoritarian conservatism. It is the, uh, the endless struggle, the need to be fighting against something that defines Nazism from other kinds of right-wing authoritarianism. Uh, in addition to that, the fantasy of comradeship uh, of the uh, fighting man and his uh, brothers in arms, um, which was something that uh, a great many of the um, Nazis brought with them, either from the experience of the First World War, or there were those who were too young to have served on the Western Front, or those who um, were physically uh, un uh, disqualified from, from doing so, particularly people like Goebbels, for example, uh, who existed as uh, kind of toy soldier fantasists, always hoping that they could have had a, a, a shot at the big, um, uh, the, the, the real thing. And so Nazism was suffused with this, the kind of the rhetoric of militarism and the rhetoric of kind of male companionship and, and comradeship. And as such, the uh, SS training schools within the camps uh, were places which were kind of alive with this sort of uh, this sort of discourse. And these kind of imagined memories of the trenches and the close bonding of men to one another. Um, meant that there was a powerful sense of them and us and it was ideal for dehumanising the inmates of the camps, seeing them as a kind of a dreadful threat or something to be loathed and despised. And this kind of them and us group mentality made it much easier for individual SS men to carry out uh, more and more extreme, brutal and sadistic acts um, the, the reality with SS men or any other kind of uh, authoritarian, fascist or uh, brutal uh, state-sponsored uh, killer is that they, they generally aren't born like this. They generally tend to have to go through some kind of, of process to give them the, um, 
intellectual and moral leeway to be able to perpetrate acts of immense savagery. And Theodore Eich knew this very well. He said basically the strength of bonds between the men would be uh, matched by their cruelty towards the inmates. And these are uh, schools for le- for the desensitising, um, for uh, de-empathising and for uh, enabling uh, the uh, SS alumni to get in touch with their ability to be sadistic and cruel. Uh, this is no mean feat. Human beings, by and large, have to go to significant lengths to um, lose their ability to empathise with the suffering of, of others. And this is why places like Dachau were perfect uh, environments, training environments, to bring this out in uh, individuals. I said, in service there is only merciless severity and hardness. Outside service hours there is heartwarming comradeship. Tolerance, he reminded his uh, SS men, meant weakness. And therefore, in order to demonstrate their fidelity to the cause, in order to demonstrate their fidelity to one another and their belief in Nazism, uh, ever greater acts of sadism um, had not but not just encouraged, not just expected, but were internalised by the SS men and therefore had to be performed in order to demonstrate that there was continuity and um, unity between the group. And once certain norms of violence and sadism were met, then they become the new normal and the uh, window of what is acceptable to do to an individual shifts um, towards uh, ever-increasing levels of, of violence, which become assimilated as a group norm. Cruelty is also associated in the SS with the notion of masculinity. People with compassion, men with compassion, are uh, questioned in terms of their strength, their virility, their masculinity, their sexuality. And in this way, acts of compassion were observed not just by the SS hierarchy, but by the group in which SS men uh, existed. So it was a a peer-led process as much as it was driven by the demands of the SS hierarchy, with the guards at Dachau and other camps ensuring that their contemporaries kept to the same level of uh, sadism as everybody else. Now from 1935 onwards, when Himmler had really gained full control over the, the camp empire, he made sure that he was very much a hands-on figure during uh, the expansion of the, the camp system. Um, he made sure that the, the camp grew in camp system grows in his image. Um, he made sure that uh, people like Ike and other senior figures within the, the camp system were appointed directly by him, and therefore the model for the development, not of the camps, but obviously of the camp guards, was um, straight from his own particular uh, vision. Himmler was not wildly popular with the camp SS particularly, uh, the, the camp guards uh, saw him as the, the uh, antithesis of the kind of comradeship and camaraderie that was encouraged. He had this very fastidious, bureaucratic figure who um, is obsessed with even the minutiae of rules. He is seen as a pedantic, bureaucratic um, character, um, a small-minded tyrant, as he's referred to by some of the men. Theodore Ike is a very different character, and his um, violence and sadism towards uh, prisoners is uh, matched by his uh, sycophancy towards Himmler, and his determination to uh, rise up through the ranks, his careerism, 
um, and his um, decision to put his own personal stamp on, on the camp system. Um, he developed the uh, camp empire rapidly from uh, 1935 onwards. Um, he had his own staff of uh, five in January 1935, and by December 1937 he had a staff of 49, um, with large departments, uh, with a political office, um, a personnel, an administrative and, and medical office, and the nerve centre of the camp network was his um, camp inspectorate that was run from Prince Albrechtstrasse in Berlin, uh, where the Gestapo headquarters uh, also are. From the Prince Albrechtstrasse headquarters, uh, Eich could influence what happened in any camp across Germany. And there were two key areas which he was most able to affect. Firstly was how the uh, prison guards worked, so he could um, change the uh, deportment, the attitude, the uh, roles and responsibilities and priorities of any guard uh, or all the guards across Germany and he could also affect the treatment of prisoners and it was quite straightforward for Eich to introduce new penalties and punishments for new kinds of crimes if he saw fit. The camp inspectorate finally uh, wound up at Orianenburg, uh, next door to Sachsenhausen, in a purpose-built office block that was actually built by some of the prisoners at Sachsenhausen. Um, and this was a, a large uh, T-shaped building, referred to as the T-building eventually. And the uh, a lavish uh, top tier of the building was inhabited by Eich uh, himself. Um, who didn't spare on any uh, aggrandizement and, and luxury. I like to think of himself as a, a hands-on kind of guy and uh, liked to make sure that he, alongside the men he saw himself as leading, was at the, the centre of uh, active work. Um, he didn't want himself to be thought as a bureaucrat. He wanted to be seen to be leading by example. And uh, he wanted to be seen to be working at a hectic, hectic kind of a schedule. Um, he thought himself as a kind of a role model of this kind of dynamism and action to his men. And he said uh, I, to Himmler, he wrote to Himmler a letter in August 1936 saying, I live only to fulfil my duty to my troops that I have come to be fond of. And this was part of his process of uh, keeping uh, his men true to the idea of being uh, vigorous and dynamic and, and active. The fact that it had been Ike who had effectively killed Ernst Röhm uh, gave him a legendary status uh, amongst his uh, followers within the uh, SS. And the men of the SS that uh, I uh, personally led um, believed deeply in the mission that I had uh, set out for them, the uh, rescuing, the saviour of, uh, the saving of Germany from ideologically impure and socially impure elements. They were engaged, as they saw it, in a pitch battle that perhaps others wouldn't quite understand uh, for the salvation of uh, the Reich itself. I encouraged a, a level of informality, um, a level of um, breaking with uh, rank and uh, protocol, and once again, this was a, a sort of a, a, a reference to the experience of kind of the, the, the front fighters, uh, that there was um, little rank when it came to the, the solidarity of uh, a, a racial uh, fraternity. And I, unlike Himmler, was a very kind of hail and well met sort of guy, uh, a, a drinker a smoker and a, um, a guy who was very comfortable in, in the barrack house. 
which would have been uh, beyond anything Himmler would possibly have have entertained. Eich often confined in Himmler that he found himself feeling closer to his his men than he did to his wife or his own family. Um, he presented himself as a kind of like a, a father figure to younger SS men, and it was some it was cringingly referred to as Papa Eich. Um, one SS man, Johannes Heisbrook, um, who was a uh, picked by Eich to be a platoon leader, um, after passing out of an SS leadership academy, um, he later, uh, many years later, said, "Eich was more than a commander. He was a true friend, and we were his friends in the way that only real men can be." Now, in that comment, there seems to be something kind of encoded and hidden, which I've wondered for some time um, about the, the kind of the nature of male companionship and um, masculinity uh, in, in general. The deep fraternal bonds between SS men and the uh, culture uh, that existed, which was obviously exclusively male, and one where all manner of uh, fantasies about uh, loyalty, sacrifice, fraternity, struggle uh, are encouraged and, and fostered. And it seems to be these kinds of fantasies, these kinds of uh, imaginings and depictions of uh, the uh, role and the purpose of the uh, uh, SS, that um, in the minds of the SS men elevate them from being mere sadists to being uh, a, a warrior caste there to uh, protect the nation and to protect one another and to be uh, part of a kind of secret struggle. And all these are enormously uh, appealing to uh, the, the, the male ego, the male uh, psyche, and particularly um, in, in the the kind of the decades or two after the loss of an immense um, struggle such as the First World War, uh, the failure to be victorious in the First World War presented a German masculinity with a, a, an existential crisis in the 20s and 30s. And the hypermasculinity of Nazism is partly a, a result of this. The general culture of misogyny and homophobia within the uh, Nazi uh, regime and the, the wider Nazi culture uh, was uh, designed in no small part to restore uh, German men to the position of power that they had enjoyed uh, before uh, 1914. Not really that that power had been particularly er eroded internally, but the uh, crises of war, revolution and economic crisis had been profound challenges to uh, German masculine pride and, um, and ego. And so cultures based around sort of hypermasculinity um, and the sadism and violence that go with it, it is it's unsurprising that they, they develop within this context. And so part of the, the, the whole kind of process of I started this um, podcast talking about of the um, education, if you will, of SS men was really the development of institutions that seem to be able to challenge or uh, channel these uh, forces, these psychical forces that were were there um, and be able to accentuate and bring out and amplify the capacity for sadism uh, and violence. Anyway, I hope you find this interesting and I'll continue with um, this period of exploration of the uh, SS uh, camp system um, in throughout the, uh, the coming months. Um, we'll be doing a podcast on uh, Franco, reviewing uh, the, the new book on him uh, that I'll be doing a giveaway for later in the week. So stay tuned for that. 
and do remember to pop by our Facebook page, say hi. Uh, there's some uh, really cool stuff I'm, I'm putting up there at the moment that I'm sure you'll enjoy. All the best, thanks, and bye-bye.